Could this terrifying encounter with one of the most elusive creatures in North America have been buried for over five decades? And if so, what other unknown creatures are hiding in our national parks? Welcome to Parks Unseen. I'm your host, Liam Wolf. Tonight, we dive back into the hidden archives of the National Park Service, uncovering a report that has never seen the light of day until now. Thanks to an anonymous source, we received a box of reports from the 1970s and 80s, where brave park rangers documented their eerie encounters with creatures beyond our understanding. These are their stories, unfiltered and unedited. So without further ado, let's jump right into our report. Date, September 2nd, 1972. Case ID number 373. Location, Everglades National Park. Time, 4.30 p.m. Reporting Officer, R. Wilson. The incident report reads, father and son encountered an unidentified non-native species. Details. Father and son were concluding a fishing excursion on the northeast quadrant of Sisal Pond when they suddenly detected a strong, repugnant odor permeating the air. According to the eyewitnesses, it suddenly became very quiet, noticeable in stark contrast to the buzzing of wildlife in the moments prior. Through the dense foliage, they witnessed a sudden commotion. A primate-like figure appeared to be attacking a small mammal. The creature had a large, bulky frame with broad shoulders and a thick torso, dark and shaggy fur like a primate, with patches of reddish-brown coloring. Its height was estimated to be six and a half or seven feet, with a head proportionate to the body, featuring a large but flat forehead and a slightly elongated muzzle. Its arms were described as muscular with long, dexterous fingers. Most notable was the creature's remarkable bipedal locomotion, moving across the marsh with an agility that belied its size, at a speed that, quote, seemed impossible given the terrain. As soon as they felt safe to do so, they came straight to HQ. The older gentleman was clearly trying to remain calm and reassure his son that this was nothing to worry about. But more than once, he pulled me aside to reiterate that this was unlike anything he'd encountered before, adding that as an infantryman in the US Navy, he doesn't get shaken up easily. But whatever this was, it definitely had him spooked. Although I made several attempts to ask the boy for his observations, he would not provide much verbal testimony. However, I showed him the species ID field guide, and he was able to identify characteristics from various photos. Immediately following, I conducted an investigation of the attack site with Ranger Brooks and Ranger Shelby. Except for bones from the presumed prey and indents in the thick wetland mud, the search yielded nothing that could help determine the species of the predator. Even the indents couldn't be conclusively identified as footprints. A few days later, I attempted to contact the eyewitnesses with follow-up questions, but learned the elder had been deployed to Vietnam, rendering him unreachable for further comment. We were unable to compel the young boy to discuss the sighting again, his apprehension possibly influenced by his mother's dismissal of the incident. Result. Inconclusive. Could this family have encountered a skunk ape? Sometimes called the Florida Bigfoot, this cryptid is renowned for its overpowering stench and purportedly inhabits the murky swamps of southern Florida, where dense vegetation and treacherous waterways provide ample hiding. The legend of the skunk ape gained prominence in August 1971 when an electrical engineer and amateur archaeologist named H.C. Buzz Osborne reported an encounter that occurred during an expedition in the swampland now known as Big Cypress National Preserve, even obtaining casts of the creature's giant footprints. Like so many other case studies in cryptozoology, there are claims of earlier accounts, but no record of such accounts seem to actually exist. For example, we know of one author 
who summarizes an astonishing number of early skunk ape accounts from Florida in his books. And yet, if you actually search all the newspapers from any of those dates, you'll find no legitimate record of them. If you're a die-hard cryptid enthusiast, you've probably done your own research to some degree. In 2013, a young man named Josh Highcliffe had a terrifying encounter on his property in Tunica, Mississippi. The brief iPhone video has often been described as the best footage ever captured. Here is his story. I was out hunting hogs, just sitting in part of the swamp where I've heard them before. I was wearing hunting camo and just sitting dead still, waiting for it to get dark because that's when the hogs come out. I heard a noise behind the tree I was sitting on. I thought it was the hogs, but when I got around, I could not believe my own two eyes. There was this huge black thing crouched by a dead cypress about 50 yards away. I thought it was a hog, but I saw these big shoulders and a head upright with hands. It looked like it was digging out the stump. My first instinct was to run. I, I didn't even think of shooting. Then I knew no one would believe me. It was like everything slowed down. I was scared. I, I heard a truck driving down the road and the thing stood up. I, I was trying to be dead quiet. When it stood up, I could not control myself and I ran. That stump was huge and I'd guess that sucker was seven feet tall. I'm a hunter and I'm pretty darn good at guessing size. That is no bear. I don't know what to think. If someone can tell me what it is, or if someone was trying to prank me, I don't want to go back on my land. This is the first movie I've ever put on YouTube. I always heard stories of skunk ape and honey island swamp monster from these parts, but I never thought about it being real ever. Has anyone seen anything like this in Mississippi? In my opinion, this creature more closely resembles a skunk ape than a Sasquatch, although there's been ongoing debate on both sides for over a decade. Bigfoot is known for his towering presence, typically clocking in at nine feet tall, whereas this guy is clearly a bit smaller in stature. What do you think? Global interest in the elusive skunk ape was reignited in late 2000, when the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department received a letter accompanied by two photographs, now considered to be the most famous skunk ape photo to date. The Mayaka skunk ape photos have been analyzed by experts everywhere, and there are several reasons why they remain of interest to this day. Paleontologist and author Darren Nash has done some excellent detective work on this one, which he outlined in one of his mega-thread posts on X, formerly Twitter. Here are the facts. First, the ape in the photo has at least three specific features that are unknown among the great apes. Its coloration, the shape of its prominent lower fangs, and its eye shine. As we know from most trail cam footage, Eye shine is found in animals like deer, rodents, raccoons, and even felines because of a unique layer behind their retina. But no known monkeys or apes have this layer. Secondly, experts were able to confirm that the photo depicts a three-dimensional creature, that the ape could not have been a flat, photoshopped image. If it were a person in an ape suit, the suit would have to be custom-made, as many have looked for a matching, commercially available suit and never found one. Plus, as Nash points out, the eye shine differs between the two photos, indicating live pupils contracting in response to the flash bulb. Regarding the origin of the photos themselves, a local cryptozoologist used the processing numbers visible on the photos to verify that they had, indeed, been developed in Sarasota, and that they'd been taken in the fall of 2000 and processed in December, the same month they were sent in to the sheriff's office. So, if the photos are a hoax, they were at least hoaxed in the time and place claimed, adds Brian Dunning from his Skeptoid podcast. Skunk ape enthusiasts, however, seized upon the images as further evidence of the legendary creature. Dave Sheely was no exception. It doesn't look exactly like what I've been seeing. The hair's a little bit longer, but all the same, I do think it was a skunk ape. What he's been seeing 
has been the subject of much debate. You see, Shili is another fixture in the contemporary cryptozoology scene and somewhat of a polarizing figure. He bills himself as the Jane Goodall of skunk apes, saying, I am the state and county expert on the Florida skunk ape and have been for years. He's written a field guide, made TV appearances, continually investigated reported sightings, and established a skunk ape research headquarters on his property, where tourists can learn all about the legendary creature. This all came about thanks to his first skunk ape sighting in 1974. The moment was fleeting, but it left an indelible impression on young Sheely, who's now 50 years old. The first time I saw the skunk ape, I was 10 years old, and I was out hunting with my brother. And that particular morning, it was raining, uh, just drizzling a little bit, and we'd walked out back, and my brother saw something in the distance. But I couldn't see it because I couldn't see over the grass. And he had to pick me up. And when he picked me up and I looked out, there it was, 100 yards out, definitely a skunk ape. We'd heard about him growing up. And we were like 10 years old. But there it was, right in front of us. It was amazing. And we took off running. At that time, we were afraid. The skunk ape eventually attracted mainstream attention, thanks in part to a Florida legislative bill introduced in 1977, which would have made it illegal to take possess, harm, or molest anthropoid or humanoid animals. It was around this time that 13-year-old Dave Sheely spotted evidence of the creature once again, this time in the form of enormous four-toed footprints left at night near his hunting camp, deep in the Big Cypress interior. Although the bill never passed, Sheely has relentlessly pursued skunk apes ever since, and claims to have seen evidence of them on multiple occasions over the last three decades, including the occasional sighting. The skunk ape hit the news again in 1997, when passengers on a tour bus traveling through the preserve claimed they spotted the animal. This was 30, 40 people, all saying they saw the same thing. A seven-foot red-haired ape. He decided to get serious about finding it, baiting the area and finding tracks left in the night. Then, just two miles away, real estate agent Jan Brock and chief of the Ochopee Fire Control District, Vince Doer, each separately spotted a large, hairy biped just minutes apart while driving through the preserve one morning. The thing just ran in front of my car, Brock said. It was shaggy looking and very tall maybe six and a half or seven feet. Didn't really want people to think I was a little nuts, so I didn't say anything about it. Doer, who had never believed in the skunk ape before seeing it that day, was lucky enough to snap a photo before it vanished into the swamp. This became a turning point for Sheely, vowing to himself. I'm gonna spend the next six months looking for this thing. I'm not gonna do anything else. Every day, I'm gonna get up and go looking and keep doing this until I see it. And so he did. He set up tree stands all over his 30-acre property and spent the next six months baiting the area and trekking across the Everglades, trying to find the creature's trail. Finally, his tenacity paid off. One evening, I'm sitting there in my ladder stand this area, and I heard something splashing in the water, and it was coming my way, splash, splash. Black. And I looked up and there it was. It was coming right at me, maybe 100 yards, 75 yards away. It came by me. I took 27 photographs of it over a period of about seven minutes. It was uh, quite an experience. It looked like a man covered with hair, about six and a half, a little tall, six and a half, seven feet tall. The closest it came to me was about 50 yards. And as it came past that point, I caught a horrible whiff of uh, skunky odor, like a goat or something, a really strong smell associated with this. Later, Sheely returned and made a concrete cast of its footprint, which still sits in the gift shop at Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. But little did he know, he was about to get even luckier. In July of 2000, just six months before the Mayaka skunk ape photos were published, are calling it a skunk ape sighting on videotape. And now the search for the old legend of a South Florida swamp monster is getting new life. So is it real or is it a hoax?
and I got lucky. I filmed a, a seven minute video, pretty dramatic footage. In the grainy daytime footage, shot from hundreds of feet away, the creature spends a minute or so moseying around in a hummock of palm trees. Then it begins striding across the open swamp before breaking into a long-limbed run, escaping into a grove of palm trees. Where it runs across the field right here, and a lot of people, they see the video, they don't realize it's running in two foot of water and it's running as fast as a deer. The couple of television shows that really went into my video, uh, just looking at it, they'd quickly discount it and say, well, that's just somebody r running in a gorilla suit. When you get out here, it's just ridiculous. There's never been anybody that took a serious look at the video. It's right. crazy. It's been so long. And in my opinion, it's as good, if not better, than the Patterson-Gimlin film. Right. But of course, that's me, and I'm going I'm to be a little biased. But That's certainly a bold claim. Perhaps you can see why Sheely has his fans and his critics in equal measure. But he raises a point that I'd like to lift up. If evidence is gathered but never critically examined, how will the question of legitimacy ever be answered either way? Critics point out that despite the dozens of ongoing research projects conducted in the Everglades that use motion-activated trail cameras, no one has ever captured indisputable proof or discovered any remains. The empirical evidence is extremely weak, says Sharon Hill, a researcher and columnist for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. It's almost entirely eyewitness testimony, which is the most unreliable evidence you can have. Sheely responds by observing that things decompose quickly in the swamp and that at 2.2 million acres, it's the largest area of protected land east of the Mississippi, most of it rarely visited, both of which is true. It's easy to imagine that a handful of reclusive animals could live in it essentially unnoticed and leave virtually no evidence. To a curious observer, all this prompts an important question. Is Sheely a visionary biologist, a mistaken eyewitness, or an enterprising fraud? What's your opinion? For his part, Sheely defends the integrity of his footage and his evidence. I know what I've seen. He was even filmed for an episode of Finding Bigfoot, the Animal Planet reality show, but says he became infuriated when the producers balked at the logistical difficulties of traveling into the swamp to investigate a sighting and allegedly asked him to fake it in his backyard instead. In the intervening years, however, another theory has begun to emerge. In 2014, Sheely told a reporter from Smithsonian Magazine about the time a skunk ape sighting was called into him from the nearby town of Immokali, and he went to investigate. He followed a pair of tracks until they came up against something unexpected, a tall, barbed wire fence that enclosed a mysterious primate breeding facility. He stood there, listening to the whooping cries of monkeys before following the tracks as they continued away. He speculated that the skunk ape had been attracted by the cries of its distant brethren. He'd previously heard rumors of the place and even believed that its location might not be coincidental. It turns out M. Makali is home to Primate Products Incorporated, a controversial facility that breeds several species of macaque monkeys, and it isn't the only primate breeding center in the area. So that had me wondering, could a resident primate actually escape and survive in the wild? The public affairs officer at Big Cypress National Preserve says, yes, he's seen escaped primates in Big Cypress several times, likely the result of damage to breeding facilities wrought by powerful hurricanes. So it wasn't that far-fetched to think that this might be a case of mistaken identity, and the supposed skunk ape was actually an escaped primate. But, as all good investigators must do, we have to raise the question, what if it was actually a cell mutation instead? The line between real animals and cryptids, it turns out, is much messier than you might imagine. Carl Linnaeus's landmark text of modern biology listed the pelican, antelope, and narwhal as cryptids, 
As recently as the start of the 20th century, the Komodo dragon, the giant squid, and the okapi were also thought to be cryptids, before the Western scientific establishment changed its mind in the face of indisputable evidence, the animal's dead bodies. This still goes on. Dozens of new mammal species have been discovered since the start of the 21st century, although they're generally the result of more subtle taxonomic changes. Some believers argue that Bigfoot could actually be a tiny relic population of an ape species thought to have gone extinct millions of years ago. If so, it certainly wouldn't be the first species to be resurrected. This one was initially known only from fossils found in South America during the 1930s. Then, in 1971, scientists realized thousands of the animals were alive and well in the Chaco region of Argentina, even though biologists had been certain that the peccary was long extinct. Local residents, meanwhile, had been aware of the animal's existence the entire time. I think there's, there's just a lot out there that most people don't know about, that we really don't understand about the world. The biologists working here in this region of Florida know that I'm doing research. Um, some of them just disregard it as nonsense, but the ones who truly want to believe that there's things that we don't know about on this planet, the open-minded ones, even they said, Dave, we believe in what you're doing. We know you're, you're not lying. We, you know, you've just done this for too long, but Dave, it's just a group of chimpanzees that's somehow adapted to the glades and is living out there. That's all it could be. There's no skunk apes. What I'm seeing is six and a half feet tall. It's climbing trees, walks like a man. It's not a chimpanzee. Cryptid enthusiasts are disproportionately male and often share a number of traits that I can't help but see in Sheely. A distaste for authority, a rugged connection with the outdoors, and a hearty sense of individualism and self-reliance. Peter Dendel, a professor at Penn State who's written extensively about folklore and cryptozoology, says the following, in the context of the modern world, where truth is provided by the consensus of mainstream science and medicine, I think many people feel disempowered. I think cryptozoology serves as a means of staking a line and saying, you scientists don't know everything there are still truths out there to be discovered. A way of refusing to have the last piece of the unknown taken away, of imagining there's something bigger than us out there. I think enthusiasts of cryptozoology are doing something noble. They're carrying on a tradition of exploration and open-mindedness and genuine inquiry, the spirit of which has driven science for many centuries. Naturally, we wholeheartedly agree Thank you for joining us on this expedition into the enigmatic realm of our national parks. As always, we look forward to hearing about your own bone-chilling encounters with the unknown. And thanks to all of our viewers who have sent emails and recordings, questions and recommendations. We love hearing from you. Until next time, stay curious and keep your eyes open. In the wild, you never know what secrets may be lurking waiting to be unveiled in the great expanse of parks unseen.